Terra incognita spectator. Terra incognita spectator. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisf.com.au for links to our featured authors' website and publications. This month's writer is Ben Peak, whose darkly satisfying speculative fiction has appeared in a number of Australian and overseas anthologies, as well as in two novels, 26 Lies, One Truth, and the dystopian Black Sheep. Ben's story for TISF, Under the Red Sun, portrays a world where there is more use for a dead body than one might wish. One. Mother insisted that we bury her daughter in the dirt, and so we did though we were unable to protect the barren soil she lay in. On the day of her burial, I stood with my brother Henry beneath the red midday sky and dug into the dirt with one of the shovels that he had made. Neither of us had our mother's faith, but we worked as diligently as if we did. The air was still and humid, and the blades hit the ground with hard, blunt punches. Mother sat in her mechanical wheelchair beneath the shade of a bronze parasol, her thin, pale skin marked with faded words that were tattooed across her in a history of unshed blue tears. Through her cancer-ravaged vocal cords, Mother whispered to the expensive cherry-red wooden coffin beside her, and, though she could not raise her voice any more, her manner of hunching and hand movements suggested a privacy of words that I could only imagine all parents said to their children once they had passed on. Words that are kinder, gentler and perhaps more wise and knowing in this conversation than any that they had had in life. At least, I hoped those words were being passed. Mother's conversations were without haste as it took Henry and I five hours to dig a grave deep enough for her, but shallow enough for us that when we returned in the evening we would not spend the entire night redigging. My mother, as I said, had faith in God, a faith that was dying in her, yes, and a faith that Henry and I wished had died before our sister Fiona. Pragmatic, we knew that a dirt burial meant that she would be dug up by body snatchers and sold to surgeons. Fiona's skin, like Henry's and mine, was unmarked. That meant she had no history. She was clean, but for the wasting that had killed her. It would take a day, maybe two, for a snatcher to arrive. She would be stolen before the week was over, certainly. Yet we did not wish to upset Mother, frail as she was, so we dug according to her wishes knowing that we would be returning in the evening to take Fiona's body down to the ovens in Izar, two days away. Afterwards, Henry and I would sit outside the soot-encrusted monoliths and watch as the fat ashes of the weekly dead spilled across the dry, cracked riverbeds that lay in the shadows behind. The sky was red when we finished, red like freshly spilled blood as we lowered the coffin down, said our words, and wheeled Mother over the dust-stained trails of our graveyard and it was red like dried blood when we returned in the night without her. Henry and I navigated the cemetery silently. The electric brass lamp held a weak yellow eye to guide us. My brother, jingling metal with every step, carried the shovels and stretcher of his broad, muscular back without complaint. My own body ached from the unaccustomed work. I had, just before, bribed the man at the gate. He was covered in blue tattoos stronger than mother's and had a mechanical monocle over his left eye. My bribe had been to close that eye while we came and left. We did not fear the authorities, but we had no desire to upset mother should it be reported to her. With the eye closed, she would never know. That bribe, I was to learn quickly, was not necessary. In the artificial light, and with tombstones stretched like paid mourners around us, we came upon the already open and violated grave of our sister. She's gone. Henry spat in disgust and dumped the shovels and stretcher on the hard ground. She wasn't here for more than a handful of hours. I approached the edge of the grave, looked down. The wooden cover had been broken half off, and Fiona was truly gone. Bastards, Henry repeated behind me. Bloody bastards, what are they looking at? Quietly, I said, her clothes. What do you mean? Her clothes are still there. 
They lay half in the shadows of the coffin and half beneath the loose dirt. I swung the lamp down and my eye caught a flash of a bracelet. She's naked, Henry said. Her voice had been drained of its anger. In place of it was a bewildered, almost naive sense of disbelief. What kind of man would want a naked girl who died of starvation? I eased my way down the hall. Snatchers do not care about the way one has died, I said. Why strip her? he asked. I could not begin to understand it. I picked up the bracelet. Beneath it was a necklace, the chain broken. They did not take the jewelry either, I said. Do you think they've sold her? Beneath the necklace, a ring with a piece of jade in it. William, Henry demanded. I do not know. I pulled myself out of the grave with Fiona's jewelry deep within my pockets. The three pieces that she had loved most stabbed at my thighs. If they had drawn blood, I would have understood. She has been dead for three days, I said. In another seven, she'll be useless to them. Ten days. He rubbed his thick hands over his face, trying to push away the grief and concern and anger that ran across him like spilled blood. Lowering his hands, he said, How will we be able to find her? I've no idea where to begin. We will need a mortician, I told him. We're not their people. They only look for marked people. They won't help us. Staring into the empty grave, I replied quietly, I know one who will. Two. Henry and I parted outside the bronze gates of the graveyard. He climbed into a passing carriage, the shovels wrapped in an empty stretcher, and disappeared in the sound of gears and the smell of oil as two mechanical horses pulled his carriage down the paved road. Atop, the driver slowly diminished in a black and greasy smear. Despite my weariness, I was pleased to see Henry leave. He was my brother, and while we were family, we lived very different lives, and there were parts of mine I did not wish for him to learn about. Henry had earned a fine reputation as a metal artist, his skills in demand more than ever as the population of Ladorn grew and the industrialization of the country rose with it. He was serious and dedicated to his profession, and had even bought a small factory to produce his work. I, on the other hand, had none of these traits. I was frequently unemployed, had no real marketable skills outside the odd book review I wrote and relied, as even, I will admit, too readily, on mother's money for survival. However, unlike Henry, I was a man with weakness, and my weakness was not supported by society. I kept most of it private for my family's sake, and wished to continue to do so. I did not want Henry to meet Jonas, the mortician, and learn about the aspects of my life that had introduced me to him. He would be able to guess at the first of those reasons, even now, but I did not want him to know how I planned to force Jonas into doing what I wanted. Jonas lived in a large flat in the city of Ladorn, which, from the graveyard gates, was marked on the horizon by a sharp tangle of fiery red light that sat like a jewel in an uneven black crown. It was a long walk from the gates, but I found a second carriage before long. The short, graying driver nodded at my directions and pulled his tattered black coat tightly around his thin, tattooed frame. He jammed his foot down on the accelerator and the mechanical horses took off in a burst of steam while he hugged the long steering wheel. Inside the spouse carriage, I dozed off. It was uncomfortable on the flat, ripped cushions. It did nothing to improve my physical disposition by the time I had reached the destination. But I did feel somewhat rested. After paying the driver, I stood on the street and stretched and twisted my body to try and bring it back to shape. Drunken men and women passed me as I did, and one of the latter shouted a greeting. I waved, despite not knowing her. Once they had left, I crossed the street and entered a narrow alley. On either side of me, soot-covered buildings reached up seven floors. Scars of light shone feebly from the wounds. Within minutes, I had stepped into a narrow stairwell and was deep inside the building on my left. The railings of the stairwell gave me the impression that I was climbing through a mouth of broken teeth. Though, if I was climbing out of danger or into it, I was not yet sure. But for Fiona, it did not matter. I had shared everything with her, including my relationship with Jonas. Finally, I reached the fifth floor and a door with a number 86 on it. I knocked. It was late, but I knew Jonas would be awake. The door cracked open a moment later. A single dark green eye stared out. William? Yes, I replied. Can I come in? A pause. It is urgent, Jonas. The door swung open. 
Jonas was a big man, tall and made from bones too sizable for his skin, which had left his body with the taunt, stretched impression of undernourishment. He was not wearing a shirt, but even had he been, I would have been able to tell anyone who asked that his whole body was bony and thin, as his arm suggested, for it was a body that I knew intimately. Jonas's face was similarly formed, and did not suggest a kind man. It was defined by slashes, cuts made to signal a mouth that was pressed into a straight line, and dark eyes that squinted beneath heavy brows. He had thick hair that was never combed, and a thin, scratchy beard that he was unable to grow fully, and which he shaved with a straight razor every fourth or fifth day. The cold impassiveness that was in his face was not only contained there, but spread through his entire body, as if the black tattoos that ran across his arms and chest had been burned into his skin as a brand by his parents when they had been a child. Certainly, it is how the first had been done. What do you want, William? Without waiting for my answer, he turned his back on me and walked down the dark hall and into the blue, pale light of the main room. It's been three months. I wasn't expecting to see you again. If you've come to buy... No. I closed the door. Followed. I have not. I did not expect to return. He sat down carefully on one of the two old brown cloth chairs that were in the Spartan room. It smelled of antiseptic and dried flowers. The door leading into his workroom was closed. Next to the chair was a small pile of books... His reading for the evening, for Jonas was not a man who slept much. So, he said, we agree. You weren't meant to return. You're a violent man, Jonas. My mistake was that I did not see it earlier. I sat on the chair opposite. But I'm not here because of you and I. No. My sister has died. Jonas did not react with sympathy or disinterest. Instead, he waited, his green eyes still in the patient knowledge that there was more to come. Beneath that gaze, I told him what had happened. At the end, I said, I will not see her used by surgeons, Jonas. I will not have her turned into clothing for someone too rich to know when to die. That's always been a strange belief for you, he said. You're too rich and too clean to hate it, but yet, like you're kind, you're an atheist. I have no desire to live in a body of bronze organs. So you have always said, he replied. So I have. Will you find her body? It's easier to find a body that I have tattooed, or a body that has been returned. It is... Is it beyond you? His dark eyes disappeared in a slow, thoughtful blink, and then he said, No. I want you to find her. I tried to keep the desperation from my voice. Please, Jonas. I can't let her be used. She feared it more than death. Name your price. No. I continued. The things that were done! Stop. The coldness in Jonas' gaze fractured with thin cracks of emotion I had not thought to see. But it was mixed with resentment and anger, emotions that were more expected. I will find her, William. I am not a cruel man, no matter what you have thought. I know I treated you badly. I know that I hurt you. I hurt you physically. I am not proud of it. But at the same time, it gives me no pleasure to know that you would use it against me. She was my sister, I explained. There is nothing I wouldn't do for her. Three. I returned to Mother's house shortly after. There was nothing for me to do, Jonas said, though I suspected that he did not want me around. He talked of regret, but neither of us had touched and though we had passed close enough to smell each other, he in that blend of oil and chemicals and sharp aftershave. The distance between us was indefinable. We stood at opposite ends of the world. We stood as strangers. We stood behind walls. When Mother's dark house appeared before me, I had listed more than a hundred ways in which we were apart, but it was the barren gardens and the barred windows and smooth, stained brown stone that sat beneath the red-brown sky that gave me my thoughts form. One of us was that house. With a faint sigh, I entered and walked through the darkness to my bedroom, but stopped at the bottom of the stairs as Ellie, mother's maid, approached. A slim girl, dark-haired and olive-skinned, Ellie had thin, delicate black words tattooed on her left arm, and which disappeared beneath her black shirt. Her bare feet skimmed across the tiles, clean beneath the gut-off of her brown pants. It's late, I said, 
In her hand she held a glass of water with a faint orange taint to it. Is mother fine? She does not sleep well, Ellie replied. This will help her. We began walking up the stairs. I want her to have every comfort. She's... I cannot lose more family. I paused, the emotion embarrassing me. Ellie did not appear to notice. I said, what is it? A sleeping draught of sorts. A herbalist bought it over yesterday. Mother's room was stuffy and dark. Leaving the pale light of the hall, it took me a moment to find her, lying on her side with a thin blanket over her. I could hear her heavy breathing and her whispered words, a thank you, I believe, to Ellie. The young maid nodded and beckoned me over before leaving with the now empty glass. I sat down next to the bed and gazed at Mother's old, wrinkled face, slightly slack from fatigue and perhaps the beginning of the drugs in the drink. Out late, Mother whispered. Yes, sorry. Her tiny fingers fluttered in dismissal. I cannot judge you. Mother, I cannot. A sharp intake of breath. I cannot judge any of my children. No more, I have. I have judged too much. I could not reply. Her breathing settled into the pattern of sleep, but I continued to sit in the shadows. If mother had said that earlier to Fiona, but no, it did not pay to think that way. I had to deal with realities, with what had happened. Slowly I rose. I left the room, my own fatigue crashing in on me, and by the time I arrived in my own room, I could barely remove my clothes. I slept quickly, but it was fitful, restless sleep. In the morning, I remembered only that I had dreamt of Fiona's stiff fingers being massaged in oil by warm hands, and later painted an old sky blue by brushes made from bone. 4. Fiona was born ten years after me, my father's last child his only daughter, a dark-haired girl that took after him in looks and personality in the ways that his sons had never done. Partly due to his inability to understand Henry and me, and partly because she was so much like him, he had loved her the most. And it was for her, and her alone, that he enlisted the skills of a surgeon when he fell ill. She had not understood that at the time, but in the years after, Mother made sure that the knowledge was used in the cruelest way. Neither Henry nor I could stop her, for she hoarded her pain as proof that she had wasted her youth on a man who had not returned for her. In addition, she had been as horrified as all her children when her husband had returned to the house wearing the body of another man, his birth body so ravaged by cancers that nothing new could be made from it, and his chest humming the faint machine growl defiance to mortality. Mother could see nothing but betrayal in his pale skin and veins of silver and worse. It was Fiona who he first approached. Fiona who he first scooped up and held close to his chest. And Fiona who had, of course, responded by screaming, horrified by the sound, the coldness of his touch, and the perversity of her father's words emerging in a new voice. On the Wednesday two weeks after his return, the servants found father's body lying in the entrance of the house, his mechanical heart ripped out. Not for the first time I let my thoughts drift in circles about the symbolic nature that the position of his suicide occupied as I sat outside the black moon waiting for Jonas. It was a small cafe made from red brick with wide open glass windows and a series of small bronze and glass tables at the front. Above me the sky was dull, a flat red, and the wind was still, just as it had been for the entire season. It was uncomfortable but that meant no ash had been blown into the city and that the sky was not covered in fumes. I would tolerate the heat to breathe an air that did not clog my throat, as I had with Fiona before the wasting had forced her into her room. Even then, she had kept a set of bent postcards that showed the old sky and which she had pasted to the walls of her room to show her a world that did not exist, but a world that even if it did, she could not have walked into. Beneath that sky of this old world, the seasons had been on show, browns and yellows and greens. Each card held a different combination, a mix of color that signals an entirely different world to the one that any of us had been born into. At the time she had placed them up, my mother had told Fiona that the cards were a silly fancy, a child's thing, but now she kept them at her side as her diseases slowly murdered her. 
Fiona's death was a lot more difficult on Mother than Henry and I had imagined. Her withering was the physical manifestation of what Mother had done mentally, and, as Henry had said afterwards, but quietly and only once. Fiona's death was more a kindness than a cruelty. But the death had caused in Mother a sudden realization that her own mortality, coupled with the responsibility of what she had done, sent her into a black depression. It had altered all of us, I guess. I had changed, certainly. A sudden awareness of my responsibility. A responsibility that Henry had, perhaps, always been aware of. Before he left in the morning, my brother had informed me that Mother wished to visit Fiona's grave today, and that it was all she wished to do. But he had managed to convince her otherwise, telling her that she needed to rest, and that she should wait a day at least. The truth of it, however, was that we had left the grave ripped open, and he planned to return to fill the hole before she did. He had briefly asked about my night, and I told him that investigation had begun, though when he pressed for more details, I only shrugged. Jonas arrived at the cafe shortly after I did. He was wearing scuffed red and black boots, old patchwork brown pants, and a dark red shirt, the cuffs of which had frayed and were open. They revealed the black tattoos that ran down his arms and traced around the back of his hands in circling patterns. With one of those hands, he pulled at a bronze chair and sat smoothly across from me. Without waiting, I poured him a glass of water, then asked him how the night had been. Difficult, he replied, his voice carrying a hint of weariness. A lot more difficult than I had imagined. Is it impossible? I asked, unable to keep my concern from showing. If it is impossible, please tell me. We'll find other means. Jonas's long fingers wrapped around the glass lightly tapping against the clean surface with his black nails. No, it's not impossible. Just difficult. I've never had to find a clean body before. I've found men and women in new bodies, and I've found marked bodies. There's a reason behind both of those. A set of rules I can follow to find each. The return to go back to their families, their old routines, for a while at least, and marked bodies are stolen to change histories to be taken to another mortician who was willing to rewrite the original inks for God. Clean bodies are rare. Rarely buried, rarely stolen. Still, I found a surgeon who was willing to help us. He was sympathetic, I asked. No. I had no reply, so he continued speaking. The surgeon was a woman who operates a small but expensive theater on the edge of Ladon. When I first approached it, I didn't think of it as anything special. From the outside, it was small. A white-walled building of a bronze mechanical garden to keep clean. Dull flowers shined and tarnished dots slipped from leaf to leaf. One of the first creations of a surgeon. On the inside, however, the floors and wall were polished wood. And there was an elaborate pond set in the far left of the floor. Fat silver and bronze mechanical fish swam in it. A young returned sat to the right at a desk, waiting for patients. How did you pass him? I asked. I am, as you say, a violent man. Jonas's fingers tightened around the glass. Since it was early and no one else was at the clinic, I found the surgeon in a workshop out the back. Her name was Catherine. She was a large, clean-skinned woman with blonde hair and was not surprised when I entered. She continued her work soldering wires into the bones of a glass-plated hand before her. As I approached, she explained to me that the hand was nothing more than a fashion piece, something that a client wanted to wear at functions. An expensive accessory, she said. You're fairly calm, I told her. Most surgeons aren't around me. You've made quite the impression with my colleagues in the last few hours. Moose were quite terrified to find a mortician standing in their workshops, having broken through doors and destroyed mechanical eyes. News like that passes around. It passes quicker when it's reported that you're looking for a clean body. A young woman's clean body, at that. Do you have it? No. She withdrew the soldering needle and blew dirt from the end. There was the smell of burnt bone in the room. No. I'm too small a clinic for her. But you know her. I know the body. She placed the needle down on the table, and it let out a small hiss as it touched the wooden stand. 
A man approached me four days ago. He was a young man who wanted the body of a girl who had died of the wasting disease. The same girl you were looking for, I imagine. He had the location of the grave and a burial time noted. It was quite a lot of money offered for the body, but it was beyond me and beyond this clinic. I would need five other bodies the same age to replenish what had been damaged to her in the death, and the equipment that I needed to return her I would have to borrow from other clinics. I told him this. Who was he? I interrupted. She wasn't given a name. Jonas finished his glass of water, placed it down, refilled. Since she didn't ask my name, I'm inclined to believe her. Besides which, she gave me the name of the snatcher who had been responsible for stealing the body. How did she know him? Jonas shrugged. News travels fast, I suppose. You don't think it's a lie? No. I know this man. I hesitated, then said, When are you going to find him? After this. I want to go with you. Jonas shook his head and said, It's better not to know. I must! I leant forward and touched his hand. A calculated gesture. A piece of forced intimacy. Jonas jerked away. I must know, I said quietly. It'll do you no good. I must know. Please. The desperation in my voice was quite real. This cannot be kept from me. You will regret it, he said. There's nothing I don't regret already. My hands fell into my lap, heavy and useless weights. Nothing. Five. Jonas and I left the Black Moon and headed into the slums of Ladon. The streets that we walked shrank and the buildings shuffled closer together, a mouth filled with too many discoloured teeth, with each tooth overlapping another. Lines were strung out between each building, leaving a network of coloured washing and sun-faded banners hanging limply over us. The deeper we went, the more the noise of the city increased around us, with people shouting from windows and children running through the streets. There was a marionette player in one corner. The painted background was an elaborate building on fire and the sky a slow red stain. On the ground stood the first surgeon. He held broken bones and rotten meat and tried desperately to mash the two together while telling the crowd in a stuttering voice that they need not fear death, that they need not fear anything anymore. I was self-conscious as I walked down the streets, aware that my skin was too clean for the neighbourhood and that I had progressed further into the slums of Ladorn than I had ever done before. Jonas had always lived on the edge, the border where people with money and the people without could reach him equally. I had naively believed that it would be no different here than there. Still, I had to know who the man was that was looking for Fiona. I trusted no repetition of the words. Men were a side of my sister's life that she had been uncomfortable around. The memory of my father's mechanical heart, her disgust with her body, and the self-abuse that she had put herself through due to my mother's words. All of this weighed on her when man made advances. And while she had not been unattractive when she was healthy, the wasting of her body did not add to the complexion. Following Jonas, I walked down narrow alleys through a small market filled with the sound of voices and cooking meat, and the air was saturated with a mix of food and spices. As we continued walking, the spices that I could first identify disappeared, becoming lost beneath others as we passed new stalls and vendors. Finally, Jonas stopped outside a large hotel made from yellow bricks. It was called The Red Rock and was covered in thick, heavy black soot blemishes like dirty handprints. It had a paint-pilling veranda attached to the front and was occupied by three elderly men, each with faded tattoos of blue, black and red that ran up and down their bare arms and around their necks. The strongest patterns ran across their faces and skulls. The inside of the building was defined by a low wooden ceiling. Beneath it were a dozen round tables, half of them full, and there was a long bar on the far wall. A tall woman with red hair and red and black tattoos stood behind it. When she met my gaze, she did so with a hint of curiosity, but it did not linger. It drifted to Jonas, and she nodded respectfully to him. He spoke to her quietly, 
I stood in the doorway, feeling uninvited, the gaze of every figure in the room on me. And she responded with nods and points, and by placing an item in his hand. After that, he turned and motioned for me to follow him up the stairs. The hallway we entered was narrow and stained with shadows. Jonas motioned for me to be silent as he made his way up to the door numbered six. Gently, he inserted the key into the lock, the key that had been given to him by the owner, and pushed it open. A tiny room lay behind, barely big enough for the narrow double bed and the chest of drawers next to it, much less for the large man that lay on his back on the bed. He was dressed in thick brown pants and a white shirt, and his feet, which stuck out, were covered in blue-black patterns. His tattoos ran across his thick neck and left cheek in a flowing script, and though I could read only a little of what was recorded, it suggested that, for a middle-aged man, he had lived life interestingly. With a swift movement, Jonas stepped up and onto the bed. Curiously, the man did not stir. Reaching beneath his shirt, Jonas pulled a thin-bladed knife and then dropped into a crouch above the man, the blade held outwards and pressing lightly against his throat. Still, the man did not stir. Jonas whispered, Wake up, Vess. The man's eyes shut open and his body tensed, hands curling into fists, feet digging into the mattress for grip, but he did not attack. Slowly, his mouth working around the two syllables of the name, he said, Jonas. Yes. Close the door, William. Gently, I eased the door shut. You're on me, Vess said. Why are you on me? There's no need for the knife. Don't lie. I wouldn't hurt you. A tiny smile stole across Jonas's face. I wouldn't, Vess repeated. You've been stealing bodies. The knife pressed against his throat, enough to crease the skin. In response, I pressed myself against the wall, though I doubted that either man knew I was in the room anymore. You've been working for the surgeons. I told you that it was unacceptable to do their work, didn't I? Yeah. Quiet, barely audible. But I, but I have, I mean, don't lie. Jonas's voice had not raised above his initial whisper. I know you stole the body last night. It weren't marked. So? So? So I told you no more. You? Vess's voice cracked. He swallowed against an ice blade. You can't tell me how to live. I just took the body, a marked body. I left everything that was buried with her and got no right to punish me for this. The dead are sacred, Vess. The man was silent. I told you if you did this again, I would stop marking you. The man didn't respond. Vess? Yeah? Do you want that? God will not judge me proper, Jonas. A thin bead of blood ran down the blade. Who paid you? Um, a surgeon from Academy on Baker Street. Vess's dark eyes began to water. It was just money for a clean girl. I don't see no harm in it. Who's the surgeon? Francis Dillon. Why does he want the body? He said it was a job, payment. The blood slipped off the edge of the blade. Stronger now. Ah, I, I won't do it ever again. I opened my mouth, ready to press for more details, but Jonas's free hand shot up, palm flat, stopping me before I could speak. His gaze, however, never left the man beneath him. There are no more warnings, Vess. If I hear that you have snatched a body, your history will end. God will judge you on the recorded mess of your life. There is no more patience in me for you. Do you understand? Yes. The knife slipped away. Vess said, Thank you. Jonas rose above him, a tall, cold man, who, given his position, could have easily been flung to the side and attacked. But Vess didn't. The man above him had marked his skin, had inherited the job from his father, and would pass the job on to his apprentice, and no one other than those three would mark him. Vess, his body was limp, the life drained out of it, knew this knew the threat, felt it more keenly than I could ever imagine. It was a threat against the soul. To do anything but agree to Jonas's demand would be to damn himself. 6. Outside the hotel, Jonas said that he needed sleep. I wanted to go straight to the academy, but he told me, rightly, 
that it would be easier to find Fiona or the surgeon Dylan without crowds. We wouldn't be able to take her body out of the grounds in the middle of the day, he said, and added that I should rest also if I wished to come in the evening. At Mother's house, the inside was still, the air stale. Searching for Ellie, I found her in the kitchen, standing in the open back door. I asked her why the house was so closed. Your mother told me to shut everything, she said, without turning to face me. The red sky stretched out beneath her gaze. She grows foul, William. She turns the house into a coffin. I could not argue. Instead, I turned in my, my way to the stuffy rooms of my mother. Her room smelt of apple, but too thickly, and she lay on her back, her breathing shallow. Quietly, I walked to the window, but she stopped me before I could open it. It is not good for you, I said. Nothing is good for me anymore. Nothing. That's not true, I sat on the edge of her bed. You must look after yourself. I am damaged. Her pale blue eyes opened. You know that. I'm damaged. I've damaged everything around me. Mother, I damaged what he loved. The strain on her vocal cords sent her into a coughing fit, rolling onto her side. I poured her a glass of the pale orange water, and she drank it down quickly. Once she had finished, she sighed deeply and sank into the bed. He loved her, she whispered. He loved her more than me. Mother, go. Her hand lifted, fell down. Please, go. Frustrated, unable to find any words to explain how important she was, how I needed her to be strong, I did as she asked. In my own room, I dug through my drawer of pills and vials until I found a bottle of sleeping pills. They were white, not orange, and I wondered what mother was taking. Did it matter? Sighing, I washed down two pills and fell asleep beneath the afternoon's red sky. 7. William. I had bought the sleeping pills from Jonas. Drugs were how I was introduced to him, originally. It was through a friend, a simple exchange of cash for pleasure. Just another way to pass the time. It wasn't uncommon work for a mortician and Jonas made the various pills and powders and fluids that he sold in his workshop, mixing the chemicals next to the pots that he had mixed, the ink he used to mark man and woman with the history for God. In my childhood, a lean, grey-haired mortician would visit Mother. I still had memories of his long hands pouring dark blue ink into glass vials and the red cuts that those needles made in my mother. But after Father's second death, she had stopped having herself inked. Her history, she said, was finished. God could judge her on the fact that she had brought herself out of poverty, married well, and had three children. We nodded, humored her, but didn't fully understand. In the years after, her faith returned in parts, a response to her own sickness, but no needle ever pierced her skin again. William. Jonas's voice. Wake up, William. My eyes opened slowly. What are you doing here? I asked. I came to find you. His hand was resting heavily on my chest, a familiar weight, a comfortable one, a weight that, despite myself, I missed. The door was open, he continued. I came in. I'm sorry, William. Something... Something has happened downstairs. What do you mean? He shook his head gently. Get dressed first. The pressure of his hand lifted and, immediately after, I felt its absence most keenly. But then Jonas's words returned to me, spoken in his soft, gentle tone, a tone I had never heard, not even when I laid beside him. The door was open. It was never open. Mother made the servants lock it. She made her children lock it. If the door was open, then... Then what? My thoughts were blocked. The reality would be much worse. Quickly, I pulled on a pair of pants and, shirtless and bootless, stepped out of my room. Jonas was waiting for me on the balcony. In the white tiling of Mother's house, his brown and red colouring cast him as an intrusion, a stain. With that thought in my mind, his strong, patterned hand pulled me to the railing. His face, usually so cold, so impersonal, was etched with sympathy like lines of silvered age. I looked down, and in the middle of the white tiles, 
my brother lay face first, the back of his skull broken open. The blood around him had spilled into an anonymous pattern, his body having expelled all that it wished to signal his end. It was such a trifle mount in consideration. He's been dead for two hours, Jonas said. Stiffness has begun to set into the joints. His skin is changing. The blood does not flow. No, it was dark and still. There is another body in the kitchen. Around him were dry, blood-stained footsteps. Mother? I asked hoarsely. No, Ellie. Was that a relief? It was difficult to know, staring at Henry. Quietly, Jonas added, I was making her. She was one of mine. I faced him. Where's my mother? Jonas's gaze narrowed, still green, growing cold. Tell me, I asked, my hand squeezing his. Please, she's important. She's not here. What do you mean? With a deliberately slow movement, he lifted my hand from his. When he spoke next, his voice was empty of the sympathy he had previously shown, each word now sharply pronounced, a tiny knife that he meant to drive home. She's gone, William. She's not here. Your brother has been murdered. Ellie has been murdered. Your mother has not. Her wheelchair is gone. If you look down closely, you'll see a tire track through your brother's blood. A tiny rail at the edge crossing over it. I don't understand, I said, reaching for him. But he stepped back. What is going on? I thought it was your father, Jonas explained. Turning, he began to walk down the stairs. You talked about him so much, William. You talked about his death. About he loved his daughter. I asked myself, who else would have an interest in her? Is it possible that your father didn't kill himself? That it was simply staged? An elaborate lie to leave the family that rejected him? I've seen it before. And who else, when you think about it, would want the body of a girl who had wasted away? She had no lover. Your mother hated her. Your brother barely knew her. There was only you, and you... You would not do this to her. Jonas, please don't. Most snatches are done by family members. Just like any other crime, William. Jonas stepped around the stairwell and approached Henry's body. To hear you speak of your father and Fiona, it is to hear the hint of a second story. A not unusual one, true, but one that would explain why a returned man would want to bring the body of his daughter back to life. He stopped. But there are faults in that story. There's no soul in an empty body. Doesn't matter if you have faith or not, William. You can't bring back what was there. And why would your father have someone else in her body? But the bigger problem to my logic is that your father is dead. He has been dead for six years now. Dead since he ripped his heart out. The surgeon that performed his initial return told me this. Under your mother's angry eye, he came to the house and he checked every part of the body. But there was nothing left. Nothing that he could salvage. Why are you telling me this? I cried out. There is a dead girl in your kitchen, William. I know, but you do not care. I just want to know where my mother is. She's at the Academy of Surgeons, Jonas replied, his voice like bladed ice. That's where she went after killing your brother and Ellie. Eight. Jonas! I ran down the stairs, calling his name, but he paid me no heed as he stalked out. By the time I had reached the doorway, he had disappeared into the deepening shadows of the night and the houses in my neighbourhood. It did not matter, however, for I knew where he was going. I did not understand nearly enough of what he had said. The mother had stolen Fiona's body, that she had killed Henry, that she had hired a surgeon. It was ridiculous. We were family. She would not do this. She could not. Mother had not been able to lift herself out of her wheelchair for nearly two years and was dependent on servants to prepare her food. But Jonas believed that she was at the Academy of Surgeons, and that, logically, was where he was going. I quickly pulled on a shirt and boots, avoided the sight of my brother, and left the house in pursuit. I caught a carriage to the Academy and sat in the back, my hands twisted into a lump of flesh, and my pulse refusing to slow down when the sharp towers appeared before me. While not the geographical centre of Ladorn, the Academy of Surgeons had been known as the heart of the city for hundreds of years. A design built and cared for art. 
It had begun as an institution where surgeons were trained and returns were performed, but in the years since its initial opening, it had expanded in both size and concept. Returns were still handled on the campus, but its expanding dark bricked form had sprawled into yellow pavements and courses on math and science and disease as well as others. Henry had attended the three years of his apprenticeship within these walls, a mark of prestige even for mother. Henry. I stepped out of the carriage outside the academy's bronze gates. It was closed, but in the centre was a silver crest of two galloping horses. On the left was an open gate that led me into the hard, red-brown stones of the campus, my footsteps echoing in the empty, stained night. As I drew closer to the main building, my approach was smothered by sounds of boots hitting the ground, of grunts, and of words that I could not quite make out. The centre of the campus was dominated by a large building shaped like an obelisk and scattered with bright yellow lights across its form like weeping sores. It was in the light of that building that I saw three men fighting across the pavement. The first was Jonas, and he moved with a quick fluidity, ducking beneath attacks from two clean-skinned men holding blunt nightsticks. I slowed as I approached, but my arrival caused the two men fighting Jonas to pause, and using that, Jonas drove his fists into the head of the man to his right. He stumbled, and Jonas kicked his feet out from under him, while the second man hit Jonas across the side of the face. There followed, suddenly, as if it were the physical manifestation of Jonas's rage, a glint. Then the man that had hit him stumbled backwards, clutching his throat, trying to stop the blood that was spraying from his neck. Once he had fallen, Jonas walked back to the second man, and stomped viciously on his head until he went limp. Without turning to me, he said, You shouldn't be here. Go home, will you? I don't understand what's going on. Mother didn't do the things you said. I know that. You don't know. Neither do you. He shrugged and began walking up the stairs into the main building. I followed, trying to speak to him again, but he ignored me. His bruised face, which he had once turned cold and impassive to shut me out, was no longer so. Now it showed me nothing. It was as if I did not exist. As if I had never walked my fingers up and down his spine as if he had never shaved me in the mornings. Around us, electric lamps of the buildings burned in thick, buttery light, stripping back the emotions on each of us, allowing, for the first time, each of us the ability to see the other as we truly were. I saw the pride, the kindness, the ruthlessness, and he saw the hurt and pain and whatever else that I revealed. But unlike me, Jonas was not moved. He kept walking, until finally he began to descend into the bowels of the building where the operating theatres were kept. I hesitated, but followed. Until I left the narrow hallway, I had never seen a surgeon's theatre. My father had no faith, my mother more than enough, but the one thing they shared was a moral objection to returning in your own body or in others, made more so by our family history. Most returns were fashioned out of two or three bodies, with the skin being taken and preserved by those who had not died from disease. I grew up in a house that did not support returns, an anomaly, certainly, and one further raised due to the fact that father homeschooled all his children. So when I stepped into the dim operating theatre, I did not know what I would truly encounter. Jonas had already entered, shoving the double doors open, and stalked through the dim green light of the room. On the ground lay an elderly surgeon. He was tall and silver-haired and wore a white and black-edged gown. And he was quite dead, his neck having been twisted sharply so that the bones pierced the skin. I had seen too much death by then to let this anonymous corpse bother me at all. Instead, my attention was drawn to the hum in the room. It was a background noise at first, a susurration almost hypnotic once it was noticed. It was caused by three large silver boxes on the wall which were discoloured by a green light emitted from two long tubes that were suspended in the air. Each tube was filled with bubbles, Bubbles obscured the inside as if a person had breathed into each. The two tubes were also attached to a metal framework above that also kept the power boxes hanging like pendulums in place. From each pendulum, like thick tentacled hands, emerged black coils that pushed deeply into the tubes, deep into the green fluid that filled each. To the right of the room sat Mother's wheelchair, empty, but with her purse and Fiona's postcard sitting on the seat. William, Fiona's voice but my mother's words coming out of the speakers on the ground. Beneath the tubes, Jonas turned towards me. Above him, the bubbles dissipated slowly but surely to reveal mother and Fiona. 
Around each head was a crown of thin black wires. Both their eyes were open and watching me. Each movement they made was in union. Two sets of eyes blinked. Two left arms twitched. Two sets of lips parted. I don't want to die, Mother's voice began. Fiona's voice finished. Don't let him kill me. Why have you done this? I cried out. She can't reply, Jonas yelled over the hum of the machinery. She can see you, but she cannot hear you. Why did she do this? There's nothing but hate in her. I began to reply, but could not, and only shook my head. On the uniform of those men, I thought was dried blood. William, who goes to work with dried blood splashed across their clothes? Jonas reached up and grabbed one of the cables that connected the tubes, his long, black-nailed fingers curling around it tightly in a grip that would not be broken. Those are the men who came for your mother. Those are the men who killed your brother, who killed Ellie. Those men who your mother had hired days ago. Why are you saying this? I demanded. This cannot continue. You have no right. You would let this happen? He shouted. I hesitated. Would I? Would I? I heard again the faint murmur of her words emerging through Fiona's vocal cords, given sound by a fuzzy microphone in the tube with her, giving her the chance to plead for her life, to tell her son what she needed. How did Henry react to the news? With anger, I was sure. And Fiona? What would she say? Did it matter? We were family. Family. You didn't do this to your family. Mother's voice whispered my name again. Would you? Jonas demanded. She's my mother. It's not enough. Nine. In the morning, I left for Isoire with Mother, Henry, and Fiona wrapped tight in white burial sheets. I was taking all three to the ovens. I would hand each of them over to the clean-skinned men and women who operated them who had a different kind of faith than I, again. No longer an atheist, unable to believe in God, no words to mark myself with, no faith. I was lost, and after handing over the bodies to Izar, I would sit alone and wait until the end of the week when the dead were burnt. Afterwards, I did not know what I would do. For the journey there, Jonas sent a young, red-haired mortician to my mother's. My house to prepare everything. Jonas would not come himself. I would never see him again, I knew. And so, in the morning, when the mortician I did not know arrived in a carriage with my family and sat there, waiting for me to step out, I did so with a feeling describable only as emptiness. I sat inside the carriage, surrounded by my silent family and my own thoughts, while the mortician drove us down an empty road beneath a red sky that had turned black. Soon, ash would fall. Terra incognita speculative fiction. Terra incognita reviews. This month's review book is Mirror Space by Marianne de Piers. Mirror Space is the third instalment in the ongoing Sentience of Orion series. Part 2, Chaos Space, was reviewed in TISF number 5. The breakneck pace Marianne set in Chaos Space slows a little in Mirror Space, although there's still plenty going on. Mira Fedor, symbiont ship space pilot seeking some help for her embattled planet Araldus, has been captured by the Extros, non-humanesque life forms existing in an uneasy peace with the Orion League. Meanwhile, Jojo Rasterovich, the thinking man Zephod Bibelbrox, is also trapped with some very grumpy mercenaries in another extropian vessel, while devious Tyro Tecton falls foul of Lasper Far, general, mercenary and all-round bad guy. And Chin Pellegrini, heir of the now-defunct Araldus rulers and one-time rapist of Mira, is learning what being a leader really means as he guides the last survivors of his planet through its hostile environment. If you haven't read anything that's gone before, you should. The Sentience of Orion series is a lot of fun. Fast-paced, witty, 
It's space opera on an intimate scale. Yes, there are lots of big ideas supporting the action, but this tale works best at the character level. Here are real people you care about, living through extraordinary circumstances, being changed in believable ways by their experiences, and hopefully, although we don't know for sure until book four, winning out. Mirror Space continues a very satisfying series from Marianne de Piers, and I for one am looking forward to the final chapter. It can't come quick enough for my tastes. Four stars. Mirror Space by Marianne de Piers is published in Australia by Orbit. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured author's websites and for details of the publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2010. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it.